I will be talking about patients as knowers. And I'll start with some uh, quotes uh, from patients. I had acute epigastric pain going through to the back during the night, but got no relief. It was implied that it was anxiety and diazepam was prescribed with no effect. It seemed to me that in view of the massive and rapid changes in my body, a physical cause was quite likely. I felt the interest in me had waned and there was less understanding. No one took the pain seriously. This is a woman who's just given birth the night before, complained of pain, and as she says, no one took the pain seriously. These are psychiatric patients. I feel like I'm howling at the moon, no matter how coherent, how rational, how considered my arguments and my explanations for events are, that assumed level of incompetence undermines it because you're given sub-status. And another patient getting shouted at, getting called a retard, getting called a bastard by staff here, and nothing's ever done about it. Management just says, oh, away you go. You know you're imagining things, but we're not stupid. We may have mental health problems, but we're definitely not stupid. And the third, this is um, where the title of the talk comes from. I slightly modified it. Uh, this is one patient um, who has a respiratory condition. I don't mention problems because though they're real for me, they're minor in the grand scheme of things. And this is important, we'll come back to this, because this is already somebody who preemptively silences themselves. So that's a particularly interesting example. And the following one is about a gynecological examination. I had an abnormal cervical smear, so was sent to the large city teaching hospital for a coloscopy. I changed into the usual ties up the back gown with the usual vital ties missing, and then went through for the examination. Lots of big sighs from my consultant with his head between my legs. Then off he goes, leaving the room. I'm told to follow. So I arrive naked under a gown which doesn't do up, slightly damp between the legs and a bit stressed as I have to sit down and I'm worried about leaving a wet patch. He goes on to tell me I need an operation. I hear blah, blah, blah as I'm perching and panicky. And it's very difficult to think without your pants on. I said nothing. So what do these examples tell us? They tell us a few, um, I think, profoundly important things about modern, large, bureaucratic healthcare systems in the Western world. I don't think, although these examples are all taken from the UK, I don't think there is anything that you wouldn't find in patient complaints in other countries that have a similar large-scale uh, modern healthcare system. Uh, there are two broad types of epistemic complaints. Now, I call them epistemic complaints. Of course, there are also moral complaints, complaints about um, treatment that goes far beyond the epistemic domain. But what I'm interested in here is the types of, um, or the particular epistemic dimension of such complaints. We've got patient complaints of the kind I've just presented you with. We also have physician complaints, saying things like patients are irrational, patients tell us me stuff that isn't relevant, they waste my time by telling me all kinds of anecdotes I'm not interested in. Patients have no ability to discern uh, medical information from non-medical information. And I think the fact that we have such a pervasive um, <clears throat> and very familiar and very entrenched types of complaints of both of these kinds uh, should lead us to think that there's an interesting epistemic problem, peculiarly, particularly, specifically, uniquely epistemic problem in um, what's happening in healthcare. Now, what I think happens in, these, in the epistemic domain is that these types of complaints both complicate and compromise epistemic relationships. And if you think about it, a large part of what we do when we engage in any healthcare type exchange is an epistemic uh, project, right? We're trying to find out what is wrong. We're trying to give the right diagnosis. We're trying to 
um, uh, rule out other types of diagnosis. We're trying to decide whether two symptoms uh, belong to the same condition or whether there's two comorbidities going on. Uh, we're trying to decide what is the best course of action. We're trying to um, estimate which risks a particular patient may or may not want to take. Now, all of these are distinctly epistemic labors. So what is important, I think, is to understand how epistemic injustice, which is the phenomenon I'm going to describe to you in a minute, complicate and compromise the epistemic partnership between health professional and patient. The second feature is that these types of complaints are both systematic and entrenched features of healthcare. So the types of complaints I started out with, or types of narratives I started out with, are not peculiar, are not um, unusual, are not out of the ordinary, okay? They're the bread and butter of um, what patients say. And if you look at uh, websites, for example, the Patients Association, they say that patient complaints about not being listened to and not being taken seriously or communication issues are consistently and permanently in the top three most uh, concerning issues for patients. So we're looking at a really pervasive feature of the interaction between health professionals and patients. And what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to provide an epistemic analysis that will hopefully shed light on this phenomenon and then talk about some ameliorative strategies we might use to combat epistemic injustice. So I will use Miranda Fricker's concept of epistemic injustice, first uh, um, articulated in her book from 2008, um, where she, it's a short book, it's a great read, she just lays out this phenomenon, which as she says, lies at the intersection between ethics and epistemology in a really interesting and I think a very useful way. So this is a concept that has been adopted by philosophers working in a range of, of areas um, as an applied concept. And in this case, myself and my collaborator, Ian James Kidd from Nottingham University, have been applying it to the case of healthcare. Excuse me, yeah. what is epistemic? It's not a word that I'm familiar with. Okay, so epistemic just means to do with knowledge. Um, so epistemology is the field of philosophy that um, asks questions about knowledge. For example, um, how do we know that something is true? What does it mean to say that something is true? What does it mean to say that I know something rather than believe it? So that's the kind of ballpark we're, we're in. So these are complaints about knowledge and about what philosophers call testimony. And testimony here isn't just what you might say when you're giving evidence in court. Testimony is any utterance I say, even if I just say it's raining outside, you as a listener may choose whether to believe or disbelieve my testimony. So what we're looking at here is looking at patients as epistemic agents, as conveyors of knowledge and the ways in which they are believed or disbelieved, the ways in which their testimony is taken into account or not taken into account, acted on or not acted on. So in the case of the first quote, if you think about the pain relief, she says no one took the pain seriously. And she said she wasn't offered any pain relief. Okay, so that's an example where you offer testimony, but people are just, for whatever reason, not acting on it as they ought to. So these epistemic complaints, I will um, say uh, in great detail in a minute, reflect one or more types of this epistemic injustice. And I'll, I'll give a definition in a minute as well. Where do the epistemic injustices arise from? They come from negative stereotypes we have associated with ill persons and or various structural features of modern healthcare practice. So what I'm trying to identify with 
Fricker's notion of epistemic injustice, are these particularly, if you like, epistemically toned harms, harms that have to do with um, ways in which patients are taken to be knowers of their own physical state, of their own mental state, of their symptoms, of their treatment options, um, and so on. Now, what happens in the case of epistemic injustice is that patients, I suggest, suffer very distinctive disadvantages that occur because their capacities, or the capacities we take to be crucial for this epistemic exchange to take place, are considered compromised or interfered with. So in the case of the um, psychiatric patient, he says, people think I'm stupid because I've got a mental health problem. But actually, I have a mental health problem, but I'm definitely not stupid. So one mechanism of this epistemic injustice um, in which it might operate is by spilling over or becoming too, um, too broad. So you say, okay, here's somebody who suffers from, say, depression, and then you impute some kind of irrationality to them in an unjustified way that amounts to an epistemic injustice. Now, these injustices can intersect with other axes of oppression, um, such as you know, race, gender, age. Uh, I think psychiatric disorders in particular, um, psychiatric people who suffer from mental disorders are particularly vulnerable to epistemic injustice, are particularly vulnerable to stigma and stereotype of the kind I am going to describe. And these epistemic injustices also have a cumulative effect. So the impact on clinical care, as we saw in the first example, the woman asked for pain relief, but she got none. The impact on patient's health because of the interference with the clinical care. And they also impact on patient's social experiences and um, their lived experiences. And the impact on the confidence of these cumulative effects can ultimately result in people just completely doubting both their ability to know and their ability to provide knowledge, provide testimony to others in a coherent and clear way. So um, epistemic injustice is a very unique type of injustice that is done to someone in their capacity as knowers. And if you think about it, patients are always asked questions, but not necessarily all the information they give is either believed or taken into account or acted on. So um, people always say, can you confirm your name? Can you confirm your date of birth? Uh, can you confirm your address? And these are usually taken to be unproblematic requests for information. And the epistemic authority of people when they give their date of birth or name is rarely doubted. But when um, you're starting to think about more complex issues, not just, you know, show me where it hurts, but you know, people's accounts about what types of treatment they're willing to consider, um, what kinds of values they hold that may you know, impact on the type of treatment they'd be willing to consider. And also, um, especially in the case of, for example, medically unexplained symptoms, that's where we find that the doubt and the distrust and the stigma uh, start to play a very active role in generating these epistemic injustices. So, broadly speaking, there are two types of epistemic injustice. So, you know philosophers, there's nothing they like more than drawing distinctions and creating, you know, categories and subcategories and, you know. Um, so here, we'll keep it simple. I'm just going to talk about two. The first is testimonial injustice. And that's the injustice, as I just was saying earlier, that has to do with the basic level of communication between a speaker and a hearer or hearers, which is, I say something and you either believe or disbelieve me. There can also be different degrees of belief. You can believe me a little bit. If I say to you, um, oh, I don't know, I'm confident that 
the vote tomorrow in Parliament will or won't go through, you might say, well, how do you know on the basis of what do we, should we believe you? But if I say to you, um, I'm a philosopher, I'm going to tell you all this stuff about epistemology, you might be more believing because you will believe my credentials, that I've studied philosophy, that I work as a philosopher, and so on. Okay, so we can uh, believe somebody with some of their utterances, some of their testimonies, and disbelieve or believe less other testimonies. So this isn't a kind of black and white picture. It's much more graded. And if you think about it, we all make epistemic judgments about the people we speak with uh, all throughout the day, right? So if a taxi driver says, oh, the road's blocked down that way, I'm going to have to go the long way round, you might think, well, do I believe this person? Do they have an ulterior motive? You might be quite doubtful about that statement. But if a friend says to you, I'm so sorry I'm late, I tried to go that way, but the road was closed and I had to go all the way around, you're much more likely to believe them. Similarly, I don't know if, I presume some people in the audience uh, are parents, so you know, or you can, or, or indeed work in education, think about the ways in which we disbelieve children as testifiers. Um, so often children will offer testimonies and we will be much quicker to dismiss or doubt those testimonies than we would if an adult was speaking. And we almost always prefer or preferentially treat an adult testimony over a child's. And I'll give an example in a minute. But testimonial injustice occurs when negative stereotypes introduce prejudices which cause the hearer to attribute a credibility deficit to the testifier. A credibility deficit just means that what you're saying is rational, it makes perfect sense, but I'm still kind of a bit doubtful about it because you're a bit scruffy or you're old or you're not from the skin color of the people I take to have high credibility or because you're much younger than me uh, and so on. And I think we have to be really conscious that we make these judgments all the time, not just in a professional capacity. This goes, this is much broader than just thinking about healthcare professionals. We make these judgments all the time about the people we speak with. And indeed, we favor particular kinds of articulation. For example, rational, confident, uh, spoken uh, in using a vocabulary that's familiar to me and I feel comfortable with versus um, a testimony that is given by somebody who's clearly upset or agitated, um, even if they've got perfectly good reason to be agitated, a person to whom we attribute a, less, a lesser level of rationality. So we favor particular kinds of articulation. And if you think about what it means to be a patient, it means you're sick, you're unwell, you're scared, you're anxious, you might be very lonely, um, you might be in a great deal of pain and fatigue. All of these mean that your articulation is likely to be less coherent, linear, rational than the health professional. And that on its own can lead to this kind of imbalance that can lead to prejudice. Um, there's also uh, credibility excesses that again, we're very happy to attribute uh, sometimes unthinkingly, to the man in the suit, to our Prime Minister, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> not just Prime no, that's a bad example. Um, to uh, to a, a teacher or a person in a position of authority, and of course to the doctor. So I'm not saying uh, health professionals don't have knowledge. Of course they have tons of knowledge. They have tons of very precious, very useful medical knowledge. But we have to be vigilant of the possibility that we attribute credibility excess to person, to somebody, merely in virtue of their social status or social position. Now, testimonial injustice can be incidental. You know, if you're in a rush and, I don't know, somebody stops you on the street and starts telling you something, you might say, sorry, I'm, I'm in a rush. And just, you won't even consider their testimony. That's a type of incidental, if you like, testimonial injustice. 
what I'm interested in are the cases in which the testimonial injustice is systematic, which means that it tracks either a particular system, like healthcare system, and it also tracks the individual, usually because of particular characteristics they have. And the obvious ones will be the protected characteristics um, from the uh, Discrimination Act, race, gender, age, uh, sexual orientation, disability, and so on. So these are also tracker prejudices, okay? So if somebody suffers from a psychiatric disorder, employers are less likely to want to employ them, um, landlords are less likely to rent their flat to them, health professionals are less likely to believe their testimonies, and so on. So that's a prejudice that tracks a person morning to night, day after day, year after year. So you can see that the cumulative effect of what individual situations that may on their own seem quite trivial or quite minor can really add up. Now the focus of the harm here is the loss of testimonial authority. And I often think, um, so at Bristol we make our students do, um, do class presentations. When you see how nervous and shy these very competent, very smart young people are, it always makes me think they really don't take enough um, testimonial authority to themselves when they uh, stand up and speak in front of their peers. But testimonial authority can also be lost over time in the ways I was describing. There can also be loss of intellectual confidence. Okay, so a very common stereotype, um, at least of families from my generation, is that boys are smarter than girls. So I know a lot of families that had a very, very smart girl whose intelligence was overlooked and underplayed um, because there was a much brighter brother in the picture. Um, and again, if you think about a girl who's being treated dismissively and her intellectual talents are not recognized over years and years, the result could be a loss of intellectual confidence. So looking specifically at um, ill persons and testimonial injustice, there are at least three ways that persons can suffer testimonial injustice, persons who are patients who are ill. There could be this derogation I was describing, negative identity prejudicial stereotypes that shadow and colour every encounter they have with other people. And I don't know if you've ever seen, there's these videos on YouTube of... Um, it's an actor who sits outside um, Liverpool Street Station and in one, it's sort of a social experiment. In the first video, he's wearing jeans and a t-shirt and he lies, um, people assume, drunk, unconscious on the pavement for 20 minutes. The camera just stays on this guy for 20 minutes. Nobody comes to him. Nobody says, do you need help? Nobody says, do you need, are you okay? Same guy, same situation. Uh, um, lying on the pavement by Liverpool Street Station wearing a suit and within less than a minute people start coming up to him saying are you okay do you need help same actor same situation the only thing that's changed are his clothes so these identity prejudicial stereotypes have a very powerful effect on us even if that effect is unconscious to us now people can be dominated by their illness I mean people can really have a profound difficulty in articulating their needs and their symptoms simply because they're sick. Um, so if you're in terrible pain or if you suffer from dementia, these are things that will naturally and obviously are impact on your ability to provide testimony or information. But we have to remember that we tend to generalize or think that these are pervasive aspects and that we, we can believe nothing of what this person tells us. So what we need is much more acuity, much more sensitivity to the types of symptoms, to how we can help people articulate their needs and, uh, uh, and values in a, in a clearer fashion. We need a much more discerning ability instead of uh, letting these prejudices uh, take over our assessments of uh, the people we are speaking with.
Now, importantly, this domination can be actual, but it can also be presumed. So we might say, oh, you know, this person, I don't know if you've, if you've had that experience of seeing a family member of somebody who you know kind of from normal life, and then when they become ill and you go and visit them in hospital, and all of a sudden they're lying in bed and in pyjamas or whatever, and they, they, they just look so utterly different to how, how they are when they're upright and they're dressed. So that on its own can have, I think, a profound impact on the way in which patients' testimonies are assessed. So this domination can be actual, but we still need to be very vigilant so we don't overgeneralize from people's uh, local incompetencies or local issues onto more broad um, assumptions of irrationality or inarticulacy, and it can also be presumed. And what happens is we end up downgrading testimonies that would ordinarily indicate to us testimonial reliability. So normally, if somebody said to us, I'm in terrible pain, we would, we would say, well, what, what can I do to help you? But there was this woman saying, I'm in terrible pain, and yet no one felt moved to act on her utterance. So this is an example of the downgrading of a testimony. Um, I gave some contemporary examples, and I'll just give two historical examples. This is from David Wooten's very entertaining book, um, Bad Medicine. So, he says, he's talking about the discovery of nitrous oxide uh, and of the 12-year gap between when nitrous oxide was discovered, I think in the 1780s, and when it was first put into use as an anesthetic. You need to imagine what it was like to become so accustomed to the screams of patients that they seem perfectly natural and normal. So accustomed to them that you could read with interest about nitrous oxide, go to a fairground and try it out, and never imagine that it might have practical applications. The second example from Dan Dennett's Brainstorms. In the 1940s, some doctors fell under the misapprehension that curare was a general anesthetic and they administered it as such for major surgery. Now, it's not an anesthetic. It causes temporary paralysis. So, he continues, the patients were, of course, quiet under the knife, but when the effects of the curare wore off, complained bitterly of having been completely conscious and in excruciating pain. The doctors did not believe them. The fact that most of the patients were infants and small children may explain this credibility gap, okay? So here is an example of a particular intersection. Patients are also children. Eventually, a doctor bravely committed to an elaborate test, and his detailed confirmation of his subject's reports was believed by his colleagues. <clears throat> and you might say, well, that was a long time ago. But I think um, if you think about things like the Mid Staffordshire, the Mid -Staffordshire um, scandal, if you think about the inquests that are really quite a, uh, an inquiries that are quite a regular feature of, of healthcare, we can see that this is by no means um, a mistake that is relegated to the past and that we've overcome. So what would testimonial justice look like? I've talked about injustice. What would testimonial justice look like? The opposite. A testimonially just person is somebody who is alert to the possibility or fact that they might be vulnerable as hearers to testimonial injustice, to committing testimonial injustice towards other people. He or she are active in scrutinizing the credibility judgments they make and are open to calls from others to do so. And they're active in recognizing, soliciting, and including prejudicially downgraded testimonies. So sometimes, you know, the um, garbled or confused or non-linear account of somebody actually contains a lot of really valuable and relevant information. Okay, uh, you're keeping an eye on the time, Julian? Uh, you'll do fine. Okay. Okay, so that's one kind of injustice. And I'm, I'm very happy in Q&A to clarify any aspects of this if um, people want me to come back to any of these. Second type of injustice that Fricker describes is hermeneutical injustice. And hermeneutical injustice has to do with our collective 
capacity for interpreting situations or interpreting social phenomena. And hermeneutical injustice occurs when there is a gap in our collective interpretative resources that puts a person or a group at a disadvantage when they're trying to understand some of their social experiences. And this can lead to hermeneutical marginalization and social subordination. This sounds like a bit of a mouthful. So <clears throat> hermeneutical just means to do with interpretation. So whereas testimonial injustice was about people's testimonies, the facts, the, the information they're providing you with, hermeneutical injustice has to do with how people interpret particular situations. And I'll give an example. This is Fricker's own example in her book. She says, OK, so imagine women in the 1950s and 60s. And imagine these women in the workplace are subject to what we would now call sexual harassment. Okay? So men are padding their bottoms, commenting on their clothes, asking them to wear a miniskirt to work, um, making lewd comments when they walk down the corridor. They're doing all that stuff. Um, but they live in a society in which this concept of sexual harassment doesn't exist yet. So the women can't make sense of their situation. So they say, oh, he's just being friendly, or oh, him and his wife aren't getting on very well, or oh, he's just cemented as a compliment. They try and explain away a profoundly discomforting experience of being sexually harassed, which is not nice you know, on the best of day, and now is you know, flagged up, I think, very prominently in most workplaces I can think of as a, an illegitimate behavior. And Freaker says, well, imagine the time in the early 1970s when women started getting together in women's groups and started talking about their social experiences. And gradually through these conversations, this notion of sexual harassment arose. And it was needed because there was a lacuna, there was a gap in our collective hermeneutical resources. There was a gap in the ways in which we were understanding particular behaviors. And that concept of sexual harassment helped women and men um, to make sense of this set of behaviors. Okay? So what Fricker is saying is that if you don't have the interpretative resources, if your interpretation is being constantly rejected, downgraded, um, mocked, uh, dismissed as crazy or unacceptable or irrational, then you're suffering or might be suffering from hermeneutical injustice. So this type of disadvantage can, as I say, cause this interpretative marginalization. My interpretation isn't accepted. Somebody else's is, or there's a dominant interpretation that is accepted over mine. So, whereas testimonial injustice is something that is committed by one person, or by several people towards another. Hermeneutical injustice is a structural feature of, of a society. And you can try and think about the types of experiences that we're not so able to articulate to ourselves or that are just emerging in our society. So some people think that uh, uh, transgenders, gendered people's experiences of realizing and then pursuing their ambition to um, transition is a type of experience that until five or ten years ago was the subject of jokes and mockery and now is starting to be articulated and, and um, interpreted as legitimate, as serious, as concerning, as something we ought to respect. And that's a relatively recent uh, change, I think. Um, <clears throat> and of course, because the interpretative resources are missed, there's a gap for everybody, that doesn't mean that people aren't differentially affected by that gap. So there is this global cognitive disablement. None of us know what to call sexual harassment because we don't have the term, but it differentially impacts on, say, men and women in the workplace, or did. Um, yeah, and I'm just thinking of my mum told me, so she uh, trained and practiced as a physician, a psychiatrist, in the 1960s. And she said, um, people just said, you have to wear a miniskirt to work. 
you have to wear a skirt, you can't wear trousers. And people, you know, women accepted it, so they just wore, they just wore skirts. And now we would find it extremely um, uh, disrespectful, discriminatory to have that. Okay, so how do these hermeneutical gaps, interpretative gaps arise? Um, there are particular strategies, and again, these strategies might not be consciously and deliberately employed by anyone, but if you, if you think about it, you can see how they, they may operate very powerfully nonetheless. There are strategies of silencing. So we can exclude. We can say, this is a closed meeting. Um, nobody without a philosophy degree can be here. Or we say, this is a meeting only for hospital staff. Patients can't attend this meeting. Or we say patients can attend, but they can't talk. They can only sit in on the meeting without contributing to it. So these are examples uh, for st of strategies of exclusion. We're just excluding, excluding sorry, the particular interpretation that patients or non-philosophers or whoever might bring to the table. <clears throat> and this exclusion could be physical. You know, we could just shut the door in the face of the person who's trying to join the discussion. It can be social. People can be made to feel, to feel extremely uncomfortable if they are the junior person in the staff meeting or if they are the patient rep in a particular hospital or NHS committee. Um, and the silencing can also be epistemic. And uh, um, Chris Hookaway has a really nice paper where he talks about how we silence um, students when we are in conversations uh, so often after a philosophy uh, talk, people go to the pub and it's a mix of staff and students. Um, and he says, well, it's kind of implied that the students won't have anything much to say, that they don't have as much knowledge as the staff, that their contributions can just be, you know, you have to listen politely, but then you just move on to what you really wanted to talk about. So that's an example of um, a strategy of epistemic silencing. We're saying, I'm not taking you seriously because you're young and inexperienced and you don't know as much as me. There are also strategies of expression. Um, so we might say, I won't listen to you if you shout. I won't talk to you if you wave your arms around. I can't talk to you, you're too upset. Um, come see me when you're calm. There's lots of ways in which we say, we're admitting interpretations that are delivered to us in particular, particularly um, articulate or calm or rational or um, um, cool deliveries. We do, we do favor those kinds of deliveries uh, quite a lot in some contexts. So we might say that interpretation offered to me by this person who's shouting and upset and sweaty and all that, I don't want that interpretation. It's, it doesn't fit in with my framework, my epistemic framework, so I'm just going to reject that. And of course, if you think about it, the people who want to be heard, need to be heard, and are, for example, oppressed, might be rightly upset, might be rightly shouting and waving their arms, because nobody listens to them, so they, you know, they dial the volume up. Um, so you get a real vicious circle where the... Um, strategies of exclusion that depend on admitting only certain kinds of expression tend to cause the very um, types of emotive or loud expression that they set out to exclude. Uh, so it's a kind of self-fulfilling pro prophecy in that respect. As a consequence, we all suffer because we all end up with less rich, less diverse interpretations of various social phenomena, and we marginalize non-dominant resources by a dominant group or authority. Um, and I really hope you each have some budding example in your, in your heads that we can talk about in discussion. Um, I want to go back to the case of children, because this is a very chilling read. This is a quote from the inquiry into the death of Victoria Klimbier. Um, which took place in the early 2000s after she was murdered uh, and abused over a period of months by her great aunt and her great aunt's boyfriend. She was uh, 
um, over those months seen by and in touch with over 60 health and social care professionals. And as the inquiry points out, at no point during her stay in hospital did any doctor speak to Victoria in a formal attempt to find out what had happened to her, either with or without the assistance of an interpreter. Um, she was from the Ivory Coast and she spoke French, but I'm assuming it wouldn't have been too hard to find somebody who spoke French and would have been able to interpret. This is a really profoundly unsettling example um, because the result was that she died a horrific death at the hands of the very people who were meant to care for her. And what is particularly chilling is that these people, in particular her great aunt, led a campaign of deceit of the very people whose job it was to uh, see through her act and see this child um, bruised, injured, scalded, and eventually murdered, and not pick up, not see, not understand what they are looking at. So this is maybe the most extreme case of um, testimonial injustice that we can think of. And if you think about it, it's a case, um, so she's not a native speaker of English, she's black, she's a child. And there was a really um, horrible way in which these facts added up to her never ever being asked by a single person outside the present without, um, when her aunt, great aunt, wasn't in the room, what was going on exactly. So she presented over and over to hospital with horrific, unexplained injuries. And this didn't happen 100 years ago. It happened, you know, not even 20 years ago. And since that, we've had plenty of other cases um, that I think we, we've, we've all found very upsetting as a public and very difficult to comprehend. Um, but they happen and will continue to happen every day, not just with health professionals, also with other people involved in the care of these children. So, and I guess the other thing to say about children in particular is that, again, it's not just the testimonies. And I, I wrote a piece, I'll give you the reference at the end, together with a pediatrician, and I was really impressed by how astute she was about the need pediatricians or people who work with children have to, set, to tease out, to separate the uh, developmental stage of the child from, um, from e epistemic injustice. So she says, what you need to do is you need to say, okay, here's a child who is two or three or four or five or seven. They can still tell me what is going on if I just constantly and very vigilant, not about saying, oh, what does a four-year-old know? What can a two-year-old tell me? But about saying, just because somebody is at this developmental stage doesn't mean they can't articulate or express a concern. So um, after this inquiry, the take-home message was always seek the voice of the child. But of course, this came uh, too late. So ill persons and hermeneutical injustice. So if we think about it, ill persons typically suffer uh, the subordination of being a non-dominant interpretation of a particular event. So if you read someone's medical notes, they're so utterly and completely different from the person's own narrative um, that that gap starts to be apparent. Now, what goes into the medical notes is what the health professionals choose to put into these medical notes. So the absences, the gaps, the exclusions are the things we're kind of looking out for when we're trying to describe this hermeneutical injustice and also testimonial injustice. So again, repeated experiences of hermeneutical frustration can lead to people ful simply fulfilling the features of the negative stereotype. What would hermeneutical justice look like? A hermeneutically, hermeneutically just or interpretatively just person is alert to the, to the possibility or fact of these gaps in our interpretative resources, the differential impact they have on different groups, the possibility that I myself have an interpretative advantage uh, as the philosopher or the guest speaker or whatever. 
and that we might be, again, unconsciously, unwittingly, employing these strategies of exclusion and expression when we choose to accept or reject other people's points of view, interpretations, epistemic frameworks, and so on. And the hermeneutically just person would make an effort to adjust their conduct. So um, what do we end up with? I think we end up with a picture um, that is fairly checkered and requires a lot more research into um, the types of epistemic injustice we find maybe in specific areas of medicine. So just to mention a few I've worked on, children which I've mentioned, uh, psychiatry, which I've also mentioned, uh, medically contested or medically unexplained symptoms or illnesses such as um, chronic fatigue syndrome or chronic pain, which are, which are ones that uh, health professionals find difficult to deal with anyway. And we need to be very vigilant. I'm not really um, pointing an accusing finger at health professionals. What I'm, I'm pointing an accusing finger at this phenomenon of epistemic injustice. And what I think patients and health professionals have to do together is think of ways to ameliorate uh, uh, the, the outcome, to ameliorate the effects of epistemic injustice. We need to look at a few more things. We need to look at contemporary healthcare practices and policies that might, again, unwittingly encourage epistemic injustice because they privilege certain styles of speaking, um, certain forms of evidence, and certain ways of presenting and sharing knowledge. So think about the, the medical case report. What does it look like? Does a patient feature in it beyond being an exemplar of uh, a particular symptom or illness? We need to see how such practices and policies tend in practice to disable certain testimonial and interpretative activities and to undermine maybe a deeper reflection we might have on the norms and presuppositions that shape these practices of gaining knowledge, gaining medical knowledge, gaining an understanding of somebody's ailment. And we need to play, pay close attention to the theoretical frameworks from which these particular practices and policies arise. And I'm particularly interested in the naturalistic concept of disease, which I think is problematic in particular ways and can, uh, again, unwittingly support certain types of epistemic injustice. So just quickly to end up on a more positive note, here are some ameliorative strategies. <coughs> so um, we might think that there's quite a lot of work that needs to be done in applied epistemology looking at uh, concrete real-life practices, epistemic practices people have, how they uh, believe or disbelieve testimonies, how they accept or reject interpretations. We could use the philosophical method of phenomenology, which um, looks closely and intently at the lived experience, um, the trivial act of saying to somebody, how do you feel about it? What does it look like to you? How did it affect you? Is is a way of uh, starting to do that. We might want to catalogue and then educate people about the stereotypes we have about ill persons. Uh, there's huge scope for medical humanities research in various uh, areas. And we might think of reforming particular uh, practices or policies of healthcare in particular ways in order to um, address epistemic injustice. We need to identify the aspects of illness that are excluded or covered over by naturalistic conceptions of health and disease. Um, we can demonstrate the epistemic and practical significance of those aspects for clinical care, for coping. And we can identify effective practices for restoring the overlooked aspects of illness experiences uh, using a host of, of conceptual tools, again, that I'm happy to talk about it at Q&A. Thank you.